folks. Good to have everybody with us this morning. This is the last uh, Sunday of 2015. And so I have decided today to uh, cover some things that have happened in 2015 and uh, prior to that to kind of make this uh, uh, relevant to the uh, passing of time because every year at this time people uh, sing Oh Holy Night one week, the next week uh, they need somebody to hold them up that night. <laughs> That's a shame, but it is uh, true for a lot of them, no question about it. Father, I pray that you'd bless the study of your word this morning. I pray it now in Jesus' name to give me wisdom the scripture. In thy name we pray, amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 36. fourth chapter of Matthew, the Lord Jesus is preparing the Jewish people for the end time. We call it uh, the, his eschatology, doctrine of last things. And he's preparing them for the, the coming of the Lord. And uh, in verse number um, 36 of Matthew 24, here's what he says. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now the day and the hour he's talking about is second advent, second coming of Christ. Uh, good men, good men cannot, uh, cannot get over the temptation set a date. Date setting has been a plague on the church for a long time. I've got a book in my office, 88 Reasons Why Christ Should Come in 88. Well, he didn't come in 88. <laughs> but up until 88, uh, he sold a lot of books. Had a lot of people excited, but the Lord didn't show up. The fact of the matter is that when it comes to uh, prophecy, especially that part of the Bible, prophecy, that it's like the Wild West right now. I mean, just anything goes. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of this, a lot of books on prophecy are nothing in the world more than something that's written to make money. And they appeal to people, they appeal to their fears, and they try to excite people and what have you. Then there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, selling of stuff that you need to survive, survival equipment. And I'm not against survival equipment uh, per se, not at all. Uh, but the idea that, uh, you know, you... The idea that if a ministry is built on that and they sell tens of thousands of dollars worth of this stuff on a constant basis, then they're appealing to, uh, they're appealing to an element in people. You should be ready. You should be ready to, uh, to face anything. Uh, man, one of the things they drilled in my mind in the Marine Corps was be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. Uh, and that was the military. And so I'm certainly not uh, speaking against that. 2015, in particular, was uh, was a very uh, active year when it comes to uh, books and prophecies of uh, of uh, this, of uh, the rapture and second advent and and uh, apocalyptic things happening. A lot of things happened in 2015 that was supposed to have happened. If you remember, I warned you all through. I would bring it up, mention it because you've been reading this stuff. And I warned you all along, be careful, be careful, be careful. And uh, because this, uh, this appeals to, uh, to uh, the, the people uh, in, in different ways and sometimes in purient ways. And uh, so I'm going to cover some of that with you this morning. But here's the thing that I've noticed about this. Uh, you seldom ever hear... Any of these guys who write books, make all kinds of money selling those books, you hardly ever hear them come out and apologize for the fact that none of this happened. You don't hear it, do you? That's called P-R-I-D-E. But not only that, uh, it's, uh, they're hedging their bets on their next book. 
Uh, just to be honest with you this morning, folks, so many books on prophecy and so much stuff uh, that's been printed like that is just a bunch of garbage. I've got, I've got a pile. I bought, I bought book after book after book after book when I first got saved. I've got a library of stuff that I wouldn't, e I wouldn't even bother to put back on the shelves. When we moved out of this office and, and built a new office back here in the back, I don't have a single book up yet. And I've got, I've got box after box after box after box of books that I've bought down through the years. And many of them I, may, I have no intention to ever put back up again. If you need a good, good doorstop, well, you can have a box full of them. <laughs> They're useless. Junk. Just like 88 reasons why Christ will come in 88. That's junk. That's garbage. That's all it is. But down through the years, it hasn't stopped them from prophesying. Here's one written December the 7th, 2012 by Dinah Spector, Dina Spector. This is from the Business Insider now. This is the Business Insider, a business website. She says, you have exactly 14 days till the end of the world, according to the ancient prediction, based on the Mayan calendar. How many remember all that stuff about the Mayan calendar? Okay, you remember all that? That was good hype while it was happening. What happened? Zip. Okay, nothing. Nothing happened. NASA and the U.S. government have made clear that apocalypse rumors are false, though it has not stopped people from preparing for Earth's imminent destruction. Now, let me give you another warning here. Uh, I'm not interested in what the government thinks about anything, or NASA, or, or the White House, or any of the rest of it when it comes to the Bible. They need to stay with rockets and their business, and they're okay, but I'm going to stick with the Bible. I still believe in the second coming of Christ. I still believe in the rapture of the church of God. I still believe the book of Revelation is true, but I'm not going to get caught up in the hype. I've been at this a long time, and I've watched these people as they come along, and they do this, and then they just fade off and don't say a word. These guys ought to be out here right now apologizing to people. For example, Y2K. How many of you remember Y2K? All right, everybody was all fired up. The idea was that when the computer flips over to, uh, to the year 2000, that for whoever started writing the computer code, it had to do with the code somehow or another, uh, they didn't consider what might happen when it went into two zeros, I think it was, or something of that nature, and that everything's just going to quit. All the computers are going to go haywire, haywire uh, airplanes are going to fall out of the sky, this, that, so forth. And I, tr I watched that for a couple of years. I really did. I watched it and stayed on that thing for a couple of years. And that was the last time that I ever really did take anything serious about that. I had my basement full of water, beans, everything else. I was ready. I was. I had big barrels of water down there. I was ready. Went out and bought a 308, got plenty of ammunition. I was locked and loaded and ready for bear. <laughs> you know what happened to Y2K? Zip. Zip. Nothing. Okay? And that did something to me. That did something to me. That was 15 years ago. That did something to me. You better believe it did. That did. I guess God needed to do that to wake this old boy up. And did I ever wake up? And, uh, and since then, I have been very skeptical when it comes to all this stuff that's coming along. Uh, this website here, it mentions a bunch of, bunch of things. But I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's just get down to 2015. We can talk about the Millerites. We can talk about the Seventh-day Adventists. We can talk about the Mormons. We can talk about all of the prophecies that they've had down through the years, and they've gathered on the top of mountains. They've sold all their possessions, and the Lord didn't come back, and, uh, you know, and, and stuff like that's happened. Listen carefully to this, though. This is from, this is from Right Wing Watch. Now, who is this? This is not a Christian website. These people are not your friends. But if you want to find out how the other side sees what you're doing, go listen to the other side. And this is what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to read what they have to say about all of this stuff in 2015 that didn't happen. Would you like to hear what they've got to say? This is what they say about 2015 that didn't happen. All right, now listen to this. Conservative commentators are running out of time for all of their dire prophecies about President Obama to come true, including fears about the looming imposition of martial law, establishment of Obama's private army, and the assassination of conservative leaders. Right-wing pundits also seem to have missed with their prophecies about financial collapse, natural disasters, and widespread unrest coming in 2015. Let's focus on September. Listen to this. 
Several religious pundits jumped on a nonsensical and convoluted tale about how blood moons and the Shemata, a biblical day of debt relief, would lead to some sort of disaster in America on September the 13th. The far-right website, World Net Daily, how many's heard of the World Net Daily? Uh, marked the arrival of Shemata with articles titled, quote, Mark this date for potential disaster. Another, get ready, biblical Shemata begins this week. Another, count down to disaster. All right, these are, these are major headlines to grab your attention. One of the leading propagators of this theory was Messianic rabbi and religious right fixture, Jonathan Kahn, who even wrote a book on the matter. Now, let me say this right now. I believe this is a good man. I've heard him. I heard him preach a message up there in Washington, D.C., and he laid it down the way it was. I mean, he had a very good perspective on, on what's going on in the government, and I believe, he's a, I believe he loves the Lord. Uh, so this is not up here this morning to destroy his character. I'm simply giving it to you in context as the way they see it. How many understand what I'm saying here today? If you can't do this, folks, you can't do anything. You understand the problem? You know, you understand what's killing the churches now? Is this, uh, this, uh, the churches also are politically correct in religion. You understand that? There are certain things that they will never touch. There are certain things they'll never say. And that, and it, and it just, ignorance propagates ignorance. And when you're, and when all you've got is a bunch of ignorant people, then you are, then you are like sheep led to the slaughter. And that's what's going on. So the idea here this morning is not to crucify Jonathan Kahn or the other names that I name. I'm simply giving you what these ultra left wing websites have to say in their take on what happened in September of this past year. And it's not good. And all of this hype didn't help anybody. As a matter of fact, there's an awful lot of people out there that are using it now against the church and against prophecy. But anyway, essentially Khan claimed that prophecies pertaining to biblical Israel can now apply to the U.S. because the founding fathers, like ancient Hebrews, made a covenant with God. As a result of the country breaking that covenant due to national sins like gay marriage and legal abortion, he forecasted that September the 13th will be the date that America faced divine punishment. Contrary to Kahn's predictions, nothing catastrophic happened on that day in the U.S. Kahn defended his prophecy by pointing to an earthquake of the Gulf of Mexico, a body of water which he conveniently forgot to mention borders Mexico, not the U.S. He also claimed that a stock market sell-off on August the 18th was close enough to his doomsday date, so he was right all along. The Dow Jones has since rebounded since the August correction, he went on to insist that anything bad that happens between September 15, September 2015, September 2016 would also validate his prophecy. Khan's prophecy caught on with commentators like Rick Wiles of True News who said that between September the 13th, October the 19th, there would be a major financial plunge of the Dow Jones stock index, possibly 30% or more, as God sent a big attitude adjustment to America. The Dow Jones actually went up during that time. Televangelist John Hagee went even further, claiming that there could be a 50% correction in the stock market in the fall due to the Shemata and blood moon prophecies. Quote, I believe in the fall of this year, America and the world will face another economic crisis, perhaps as a result of war in the Middle East or an, un or an economic crash, unquote. Now, if you want to go to this website, and look at the videos. You'll hear these people say this with their own words. That's always good to, to, to get it at the source instead of hearing what somebody said that somebody said about what somebody said. You're much better off doing that. So what are they doing? He's using John Hagee and what he said in the book he wrote. Jim Baker, a televangelist who himself claims to receive personal messages from God and regularly had Khan on his program to discuss the Shemata Blood Moon's prophecy and made a few predictions of his own about September the 13th. Quote, there is going to be a crash on September the 13th, unquote. Baker warned his viewers, also predicting that something would happen to Pope Francis during his September visit to America. 
He also said that on September the 13th, the U.S. could be hit by a typhoon, earthquake, bombing, or financial meltdown. Quote, God spoke to me. Now, after blowing his September prophecy, Khan saw a biblical threat from Hurricane Joachim. He said that the Supreme Court's gay marriage ruling and the White House's LGBT Pride Month celebration with rainbow lights had provoked God's judgment, and now Hurricane Joachim would strike Washington, D.C. Khan wasn't alone, as Wiles, too, said that God was using Hurricane Joachim to punish the U.S. by striking Washington, D.C., and New York. In parenthesis, it didn't hit either city. Con and Wiles were far from alone in making wild predictions about the effects of gay marriage. Now, you understand where this guy's coming from. He is in complete support of gay marriage. Please understand, this is not a Christian. This is an ultra-liberal website. This is his view on all of this that go, that's gone on about prophecies in September and about the end of the world and all this stuff, this is the way they see it, and he is making a field day out of it. One month before the Supreme Court issued its ruling, American Family Radio host Brian Fisher warned that if the Supreme Court struck down state bans on marriage equality, then we would see violence in the streets. Quote, if the Supreme Court continues to overreach and they are checked, we are headed towards civil unrest. I don't think there's any other way around it. If it's not stopped and reversed, the tyrannical overreach of the Supreme Court is we have our social dislocation, and I believe we are going to have violence as a result." Unquote. World Net Daily editor Joseph Farrar predicted that millions of Americans would flee the country to evade gay marriage. Televangelist Pat Robertson warned of financial calamities as a sign of God's judgment for the Supreme Court marriage equality ruling, and Massachusetts-based pastor Scott Lively said the Antichrist could emerge around September the 23rd. Other religious right leaders predicted that the Supreme Court's marriage equality ruling would lead to divine punishment, war, revolution, chaos, and the destruction of America. Now, these people are very good at listening to what the preachers are saying and reading what the books have to say and watching the videos. Then there was Jade Helm, 15. The Jade Helm conspiracy theory, which was cynically fueled by GOP politicians, centered around fears the military training exercise taking place between July 15 and September 15th of this year would produce grave consequences, such as the federal takeover of Texas, the declaration of martial law and the transformation of closed Walmart stores into FEMA camps. Others thought that Jade Helm 15 was a deliberate attempt to stoke chaos which would justify military rule in the future. May In May, one poll found that one in three Republicans, including half of the Tea Party supporters, agreed that the government is trying to take over Texas. This is probably the most controversial because this, is a, this has a lot of basis in fact. Wiles, the True News host, said Jane Helm 15 was the preparation for or the actual implementation of a roundup of patriotic men, describing the drill as a two-month-long night of the, long, of the long knives that would lead to a civil war. In one discussion of Jade Helm, Wiles warned of the prospect of the Obama administration launching a nuclear electromagnetic pulse attack against Texas and, opp and oppressing Americans who live in the South and Midwest. So now, uh, before I read any more, think. If the elite, and I believe the elite, are definitely pulling the strings, calling the shots. If they want to make you look like a fool, they can spoon feed you with certain catastrophic events that are coming or give you certain prophecies that are going to be fulfilled and blah, blah, blah. And all of that is to make you look like a fool, but not only that, but to cry wolf. And I believe the greater purpose is the cry wolf. It's to get the people numbed to the point to where they've heard this before and heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it, and heard it until they stop listening and then the end does come. The Lord is coming back. The Antichrist will rise. We have 
a number of antichrists in our government right now. No question about that. No question whatsoever about that. None. My purpose in this this morning is to help you understand that as a pastor of a local assembly, I am held accountable before God to see to it that when you are dealing with issues like this, that you don't get caught up in the latest fad or latest uh, whatever's coming down the pike to get your money, and then later on, you don't hear a word out of these people. Not a word. If I had told you that the rapture was going to take place September the 13th of this year, and obviously it didn't take place, I had a choice to do one of two things. Either never show my face in here again, that would be the easy route, or come in here and get up and publicly apologize to you for, for violating the scripture right off the bat. For nobody knows that day. Did you know that Harold Camping, a radio preacher, has set, I think it's three dates for the coming of the Lord? Three of them. And obviously, you know, you don't have to say the Lord didn't come back. <laughs> he has set three dates and he's not alone. And they still do it. And they continue to do it. And when all of this is over, somebody will come out and write another book. Somebody will come out and make another video. And they'll come out with all of this stuff they've put together. And it'll sell like hotcakes and get everybody all worked up. But the Lord is not going to come back until he comes back. And nobody knows that hour, not even the Son of God himself, but the Father only. That's what the scripture says. The Father only. And it doesn't make us look good to the world. What you ought to do, I do things that most people don't do. I got on this website, and I went down at the bottom of the page and started reading the comments. Most of these websites, when you have, a, when you have something, you have comments. Now, granted, some of the terminology in the words down there not what you'd want to get up and use in Sunday school. But I'll tell you right now, you'll get a, you'll get a firsthand view of what the people think. And you would be amazed at how utterly, how, how that people, how, the, how these prophecy teachers are held in utter contempt. Contempt. In utter contempt by the people out there who would not darken a church door. They've found something to hide behind. They're hiding behind the prophecy teachers. Listen, when a man will not let his sins be covered by the blood of Christ, he has to hide behind something. Because the preaching of the gospel exposes him for what he really is, and he can't live with that. So he's got to have something to hide behind. And that's religion. And that's the way it works. And so it on and on and on it goes. And they love these prophecy teachers because they can hide behind them. And they can justify themselves. They can say, is that what makes up your church? Is that what your faith is all about? Now, where is your faith now? When did the Lord... When, you know, the Lord hasn't come back, so now what do you believe? And what the church ought to do is hold their feet to the fire. These fellows that write the books, make the money. Folks, you understand how many millions of dollars are involved in all these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of prophecy books that go out and nothing happens? They're making a pile of money. The church ought to hold their feet to the fire and say, man up and admit that you were wrong and confess it to the church and to the world and then shut up <laughs> and quit writing books about the coming of the Lord like you know when he's coming back. Folks, it would be a small matter in my little short lifetime. I'm, I'm, I'm here today and I'm gone tomorrow for the Lord not to come back for another two or three hundred years. It's possible, folks. It's very possible that he will not come back in your lifetime. It's possible he will. That's called the blessed hope. Amen. But he may not come in your lifetime. Now, how much better are, are we than all of the tens of millions that have gone on before us? Think about all of them. Think about your mother and your father and your grandmother and your grandfather. And most of them lived a much better life than we do today. And were far more consecrated in their Christian faith. Yet they went the way of all the flesh or all the earth. They didn't see the Lord come back in their lifetime. What makes us think 
with our arrogance and self-centeredness and all about me, myself, and I. What, why, why should we think that we should be the generation that sees the coming of the Lord? See how easily it appeals to your pride? Now, <clears throat> if it is the blessed hope where you have enough, understand that nothing's going to get any better about this world, and your attitude toward the coming of the Lord is not so much the idea that you think you're better than the generation that went before you, that you're some chosen generation or some great thing, but you're simply saying, Lord, there's no hope down here. There's no hope here. And I know whom I have believed, and I know where I'm going when I leave this world, but I would like to see you come back. That's the right attitude to have. That's the right attitude to have. You've got to be so careful with this. This is, you know, this last... This last September was just one more, one more in a long line of predictions about the coming of the Lord. Ever since President Obama won the 2008 election, right-wing activists have claimed that he's on the verge of creating a private army akin to Hitler's brown shirts. With 2015 coming to a close, it looks like Obama has just one year left to create such a force. But conservative talk show host Michael Savage has a pretty good idea of what Obama has in mind. Savage, who believes that Obama's bent on committing anti-white genocide and rounding up conservatives, has alleged that the president intends to create a personal force composing of Syrian refugees, Black Lives Matter demonstrators, and members of the Crips and Bloods, whom he thinks will be armed and deputized by Obama. Now this is according to what this man says. Remember, all of this stuff that I'm reading from this website is what these people say. This is what Brian Tashman, uh, uh, December the 23rd, 2015, 1115 AM, submitted by this man on Right Wing Watch. I've never met him. I wouldn't know him if he was standing in front of me. I haven't done any research into this man. I have no idea who Brian Tashman is. Now that's the truth before God. I do not know this man, but I'm reading to you what he has to say about these people. And I'm not reading to you in the dark. How many of you have followed me so far and are fully aware of what has gone on in the last few months in this country? Sure you are. Sure you are. And most people, though, will not, ask, will not ask the questions publicly because they don't want to get into a conversation or what have you. But the truth of the matter is, this is the kind of thing that hurts. <coughs> and so, President Obama is supposed to be raising a private army. Well, the, we've got 12 months left. And uh, uh, I have read that he intends to implement gun control in the coming months. And there are other things on his agenda that he intends to get done. Now, here's the thing. If you've been in office for seven years, you've got one year left, all right, it's obvious that if he does have an agenda, his time is running out and he knows it, and whatever he intends to get done, it, he's going to speed up with it. You see what I mean? doesn't have time to fool around. He's got to get it done. So 2016 may be a very interesting year to just watch and see what happens. We don't know. Just be alert and watch. Far-right pundit Glenn Beck, the self-proclaimed self prop, prophet of imminent mass killing, civil war, race, riots, revolution, enslavement, and internment camps, responded to the demonstrations and riots in Baltimore following the death of a black man in police custody by making it all about him and how government assassins may kill him because he is such a great leader who knows about their nefarious schemes. The conservative pundit said that the protests and riots in April and May were all designed to justify a federal takeover of local police forces. That's all that's happening right now. This is a show. We're watching a script and a play play out in front of us. None of this stuff is real. Those riots in Baltimore, that wasn't real. At some point, there will be a straw that breaks the camel's back and it will set the whole country on fire. And what happens? We will cry out for police help. The police will be overwhelmed. The Department of Justice will say, we're going to take over policing. We'll coordinate it from here, and you're done. It's lights out, Republic. Beck went on to explain that he and other leaders who are exposing such deeds to the masses may be killed. 
just like how Hitler killed potential rivals in the Night of the Long Knives and Turkish leaders killed Armenian leaders at the beginning of the Armenian Genocide. I appreciate the fact you put a, a historical fact in there. They do that so there is nothing left but sheep and no shepherds, he explained, claiming that these nefarious agents are going after him and not his 10 million viewers because they know they cannot kill 10 million people in one night. Prepare for a time when voices like mine and others are no longer heard and yours is the only voice, he said. All right, so finish the article. And it's quite a remarkable thing when you look at how these... Now, here's the thing. You need to understand this. This man's not alone in his opinion. Uh, you know, you have this one article by Brian Tashman, uh, but he certainly is not alone when it comes to his observations of what's going on in the religious world. So what should you do? Stay in your Bible, stay on your knees, stay right with God, and keep looking for the coming of the Lord. That's what you should do. And don't be discouraged when they get uh, people all worked up and it doesn't happen according to what they say is going to happen. Now, I made a whole lot of friends this morning, and uh, I'll guarantee you that I'll be the, I'll be the uh, darling of the, uh, the ministerial association all around the country, and they'll love Preacher Lawson. They haven't been at the door of death yet. Let me explain something to you. Until you've been at the door of death, you don't know what I'm talking about. Until you look death right square in the face and know that you could be gone at any moment. And it's at that point that you come face to face with your maker and your creator. And you come out of a place like that. You don't care what men think. That's what we need in the pulpit. We need preachers that don't care what the reverends out there think. I've been there. I'm alive right now, bless his holy name, because <laughs> God gave me life. I owe him everything. I exist because God was gracious and merciful and raised me up. And I remind him every day that I live on this earth that my life is in his hands and I'm here to please God and not men. I remind him every day that I am so thankful for what God's done for me, how good he's been to me. He's a good, gracious God. He was there when I needed him. He didn't fail me. He didn't let me down. He went with me right to the door of death. I understand what it feels like. I know what it's like. And buddy, when you come out of something like that, you don't care what the mega church pastors think. You don't care what the press thinks. You don't care what the government thinks. You don't care what any of them think. Because you know what's real and what matters. And I got that. I got it firsthand. I got it firsthand. I got it firsthand. And uh, I, uh, <laughs> it, it changed my life again. My life's been changed a number of times down through the years. It's been a change. Changed first time, 73, got saved. Changed again on the back porch up here in this old house. Changed again when I came face to face with death. Amen. Yes, sir. I agree, brother. That's the truth. Sure. What would the church do if real revival came? I heard somebody last night talking about revival. They wanted revival. Do you really want revival? Do you know what that do to your life? Do you know what a real revival would do? I've been a pastor for nearly 40 years. I've seen one revival in 40 years. Started right here. People would leave this church and come back and get down here in this altar. People would come in here, and the minute they walked through the door, you could see the countenance on their face change. They felt something hit them right in the face when they walked in here. And it stayed here for weeks. But then all hell broke loose. The people weren't ready for the opposition that was about to come. They weren't ready for, they weren't ready. They enjoyed the fruits of real revival, but they weren't ready for the real battle. 
That's when the real fight takes place. There is no way under the sun that Satan is going to let this little church here on Woodrow Drive experience a real revival and not come in here locked and loaded. He came in here with everything he had. He hit this church like you wouldn't believe. The way he hit Temple Baptist Church, most churches would have folded a long time ago. It didn't take me long to find out that I had a lot of brethren out there that were wishing we did fold. Oh, yeah. I learned some hard lessons. I watched them as they salivated and they watched us. And I knew in their heart they wanted me to go down. I heard people walk out of this building that told barefaced lies and knew they were lies when they told them that sat here in this congregation and listened to me preach week in and week out. They walked out of here and they told barefaced lies. Knew it when they told it that it was a lie. That's how Satan uses people. A real revival is a remarkable thing. I don't really think you can schedule a revival. But I think you can hunger for one. But I'm going to tell you something right now. You may have a personal revival in your life. I hope you're mature enough to handle it. I'm not trying to dissuade you from a revival. But I am trying to tell you this. I've been at this a long time, friends. Revival has nothing to do with you worked up emotionally, hooping and hollering. Thank God for the hoop and thank God for the holler. I get tired of dead services too. But a real revival is when something begins to happen in your life that is profoundly spiritual and it moves you and changes you and redoes you. And then here's the part I warn you about. If that happens to you, get ready. Your enemy will come after you. He will come after you with new tactics that you've never seen before. And it'll be a time when you learn victory. You get victory over your enemy. And you'll grow like you've never... You'll grow faster in a week or two or a month or so forth in a real revival than it takes you 10 or 20 years to grow if you're able to handle your enemy when he comes against you. And he will come against you. He will come against you. He will come against you. All over this town... They were saying, Lawson's finished. He's done. He's, it's over. But it wasn't over. And why it wasn't over? Because Lawson was on his face in his hole crying out to God. Amen. Lawson hadn't done anything. If I'd been out here laying up drunk, shooting dope, chasing women, doing the things that a lot of these preachers in this town are doing right now, if I'd been living a life like that and then it all blew up in my face, all I could have said is, God, I deserve it. But you know what? He changed me through it. He matured me through it. He had firmly established a foundation in him. I trust him, folks, and I trust him alone. I trust him. He's never failed me. He brought me through it. He was right by my side when I needed him. I'm telling you what I know to be true. God did not fail me. But he let me hurt. He let me learn. He let me experience things I'd never experienced before. And when he brought me through it, I was a better man for it. If I had, I would never have chosen that route. Never would I have chosen that route. But he brought me through it. So I wasn't the same when I came through it. And I learned a lot about people. Learned a lot about them. Yes, sir, brother. Listen to this brother, folks. Listen to him.
No, it came from inside. You won't hear one preacher out of a thousand that'll, that'll say what this brother's saying right here. Sure. You won't hear one preacher out of a thousand that'll say that. But what you said is the truth. It rings very clear. Very clear. Bottom line is, God began to make a move in your church. You had a real spiritual experience. You saw something that was profound and different. And, 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 and in maturity, most of them weren't able to handle it. They weren't able to handle it. That's what happened. Yes, sir. That's right. Well, see, the point in all of this this morning is that when you get caught up in this big emotional worked up thing, after then you get let down, you stop looking for the coming of the Lord. And some people get so bad, they just leave the church. It drives them away. And that's a shame that that happens. Shouldn't happen. Why should real preaching of the Scripture and why should the real blessed hope and glory appear? And why should that drive you off? It ought to pull you closer to God if it's preached in truth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank God for the support. Yeah, amen. 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 And God sent me a nurse. She's a cardiac nurse. So if I fall over here on the floor, I got somebody can come over and help me out. <laughs> amen. I came all the way from Beaumont, Texas. Uh, I done told the Lord if I'm leaving here, I want to leave from right here. <laughs> this would be the best place to go from. Amen. The launching pad. I mean, it can be kind of rough on you folks to, be, to watch this preacher drop where I'm standing. But just remember, if that happens, that's what I want. <laughs> Amen. I want to, like old Brother Ed Ballou used to sing, I want to die on the battlefield. <laughs> Amen. With glory in my soul. Amen. Nothing greater than that. All right. Well, so you should, are you still looking for the Lord to come back? But yeah, I am. I am. And I'm not disappointed one bit because I wasn't appointed to begin with. <laughs> I didn't get caught up in it. But as a pastor, I had to tell you what was going on and make you aware of it. And I'll continue to do that in the future. But uh, no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with the coming of the Lord. All right, well, that word prayer will let you go. Yes, sir. I don't keep up a whole lot with him. I know he just, he almost died not too long ago. Yeah, I know he's a lot about prophecy. Where, where, uh, where Brother Van Impey is real good is focusing on what's going on. He keeps that before the people. He takes positions that a lot of people will not take. And, uh, and he'll bring, the, he got kicked off of TBN, you know. Jan and Paul Crouch kicked him off of TBN because of some of the things he said. Uh, years ago, he wrote a book, uh, Heart Disease in the Body of Christ, which, uh, which angered a lot of conservatives and, uh, and set him apart from them. Uh, he, he began to warm up to the Catholics on TV. You can see a lot of that going on. And uh, that's between him and God to judge that. Uh, if, if you want to warm up to a Catholic to try to get a Catholic saved, that's a good thing. Amen. That's a good thing. But you've got to remember that a Catholic, just like anybody else, needs to be born again. Just like anybody. You know, the Apostle Paul said, I was all things to all men. 
but uh, I don't know, I don't listen, I don't watch him that much. So I really can't say as to, has he, has he been predicting the coming of the Lord? Well, I don't know. See, I've I, never heard that man before. Yeah, I don't, I don't keep up with him that much. Yeah, to, in other words, a date setter. See, that's the point. Uh, yeah, like we all believe. But uh, I've never heard him set a date. And he's real good at keeping up. And he's good, too, for what he's been saying about Islam. Jack Van Impey has laid it out there on the line clearly. And I think that's what got him kicked off of TBN, was what he was saying about Muslims and Islam and issues like that. You know, in other words, that's courage. He had, the, he had the courage to get up there and say it, say what needed to be said, and make the application of it. And, and I respect him for that. Yes, sir. He's already been smart planning. Pardon? He's smart planning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll let you go. Brother, uh, uh, Brother Ronnie, will you dismiss him?